Ben, thank you for taking the time out. Yeah, my pleasure, Steve. Glad Mate, I follow here. you around the world. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm <laughs> yeah. like a groupie. I'm like, what do they call that? I'm, I'm like, yeah. Ben speaking. Got to go to America. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Why are you going to America again, hubby? Oh, Ben speaking. <laughs> i got to go. <laughs> you're at the forefront. You're in the lab. You're, you're the one providing the evidence for lots of things I love to talk about. But then you also have this sensational way of putting it across that we can actually understand what you're talking oh, about. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm truly uh, appreciative of that. When I first became a professor... It was a, a delightful challenge to try to find a way to convey potentially complicated ideas, not only in a way that is accessible and understandable, but also palatable and enjoyable. I am the director of the Metabolism Research Lab at Brigham Young University, and I, I greatly enjoy that role of my profession, because that's not the same thing as being a professor. There's a professor and then there's a scientist. I have the great joy of being both, which isn't uncommon, but they're not the same thing. My lab does focus generally on the metabolic origins of disease. That would perhaps be the simplest way of describing it. But in saying that, um, people would hear the metabolism, the metabolic part, and lead, perhaps, come to their own conclusions. That word can mean so many different things. So to be very precise, it is most explicitly a lab that focuses on insulin resistance, how, where it comes from, and why it's a problem. So a lot of the recent work we've done is identifying the role of some of our bigger publications recently, the role of insulin resistance in brain neurological mitochondrial disruption, or a state where the neurons of the brain are becoming insulin resistant and thereby being deprived of nutrient or energy and then contributing to a disease. And, and uh, most clearly, we were studying Alzheimer's disease. So this was viewed in the context of Alzheimer's. So that's the lab. And you had mentioned uh, touching on the insulin resistance part. I would really want, I can't say this enough, insulin resistance is invoked sometimes improperly. And, and then it's just misunderstood what it is. There needs to be two parts to this. This is a two-part pathology or a coin with two sides. Everyone appreciates the first side of the coin, which is that insulin isn't working well at certain cells of the body. Now, that is not a universal phenomenon within mm -hmm. the body. Some cells of the body are responding fine to insulin. Some aren't. But those former cells that are responding fine are put in a very difficult position when we flip this coin over and look at the other side of what we're calling insulin resistance. The other side of this, the essential second part, is the hyperinsulinemia. And now you then have a state where some of the cells of the body aren't responding well to insulin. Some are responding very well. Those that are responding very well are now inundated or excessively activated because of the chronically elevated levels of insulin. That is itself driving pathology, even separate from the, insulin re the, the altered insulin responsiveness at some of the cells. Like, for example, a, a very quick example is infertility. The most common forms of infertility are PCOS in women and erectile dysfunction in men. Both of them are heavily, if almost totally, caused by insulin resistance. Where the <laughs> earliest manifestation was the ED, then it was the hypertension where the problem starts yeah. to get more systemic, yeah. and then finally it was the outright diabetes. And then underlying all of this, of course, had been this, if we had had a clinical perspective that included insulin, yeah. It would have been detected. Insulin is the canary in the coal mine. It is the early signal that ends up telling, warning, whistling out the tune that there's a problem and we yep. need to be paying attention now before these other more chronic issues settle in. Yep. Now, the good news, the gospel of metabolism is that you are never too far gone. Yes. In a general sense, maybe your diabetes has been so bad you've lost some toes or something. That's, of course, gone. But everything else can start to be corrected and reversed, mm -hmm. and not even slowly. Yeah, This is something that can happen within weeks, within 90 days, a paper that we had published, we were able to reverse every instance of type 2 diabetes with wow. ever, without ever a single pill popped or a single syringe injected.